it's time for another collaboration video. There's going to be a playlist down below where a bunch of us have done our take on this kind of April Fool's Day themed collaboration. So the idea is read an overhyped book and see if the internet fooled us. So something on our corner of the internet that we think is so hyped and us deciding, was it worth it? And I chose to read two very popular, probably 2022 defining books <laughs> to read for this video. I was going to do a vlog and per usual, I stopped remembering to film clips. And I have so many thoughts on one of these books that I just was like, I just want to sit and talk to the camera about it. I don't want to worry about talking too much in a clip and all the thought processes that goes into making a quality vlog, which people who can make great vlogs, you guys are amazing. I don't necessarily think I'm one of those people. <laughs> so what did I choose to read for this project? I chose to read Legends and Lattes and Babel by Rav Kuang. And What's actually interesting, because I was looking at some stuff after I've read both of these books, is they actually have very similar ratings and number of ratings. So I was correct in that these are pretty much defining speculative fiction of last year. They both have 4.3 rating. I think Legends and Latte is like a 4.31. And Legends and Latte has 65,000 ratings approximately, and Babel has like 75,000 ratings. So incredibly popular books. Both of them were in the top 10 Goodreads Choice Awards, both of them nominated for Nebula. I wouldn't be surprised if one or both of them aren't nominated for the Hugo. And both of them I really didn't want to read, okay? And that's why I decided to do it for this video because for vastly different reasons, I was very nervous about picking up both of these books. Mainly because they are so popular and I want to like everything I pick up and read, but there were a lot of buzzwords that people talked about in their videos and a lot of things I kind of knew from past experiences with one of these authors that I was just like, I don't know. I don't know if it'll be worth the hype for me, but I did it. I read both these books this month and we are going to basically go through both of them. We're going to start with the one I read first, and that is Legends and Lattes. So this one, the reason I was nervous, let's, let's start with that. Why did I think this might not live up to the hype for me is everyone says this is so cozy. This is so cute. It's a warm hug of a book, low stakes fantasy. And although I'm not someone who needs high stakes, I actually read a lot of slice of life stuff. Every time people really love a book with these buzzwords, I'm usually like, that was fine. Like, not bad. I normally am never like, this was awful. But like, for example, House in the Cerulean Sea. When that book came out, everyone loved that book when that book first came out. And I was like, it's fine. It's, it's fine. <laughs> like, that's how I felt. So I think I was nervous this would be another one of those moments. And it wasn't. I was so excited. So Full, full disclosure on how I chose to read it, because when I do reviews, I do think it's important knowing the context of how you read something. I came back from my trip and we had a really long travel day coming back from Colombia to the United States. It was just a long travel day. Travel days just are, are long like that. And I didn't want to do anything. I had to wake up early to take my mom back to the airport. And when I got home, it's like, I'm not leaving this couch. And in my head, because I had anxiety for other reasons in my life. I'm like, if there is any day that I need an escape from anxiety and need something that'll just help me have a good day that I sh can read in one sitting, Legends and Latte, this is your moment. If it's not going to work now, it's not going to work. And thankfully, it worked incredibly well. <laughs> and actually, as I started to read it, A, I worked, re it worked really well, the writing style. The writing style was actually really good for me. Um, it flowed super easily, required so few of my brain cells to understand and connect and be immersed, which is ideal for the situation I was in. That's what I needed. And two, it's one of my favorite tropes, which like I didn't realize because even though I've heard the synopsis over and over again, Orc leaves their Dungeons and Dragons party. I know it's called something else, but you know, Orc is no longer a fighter going to open a coffee shop in a place where people don't know where coffee shops are. That is the plot. And you know, somehow I forgot that that meant this was going to be my favorite trope, which is building something from the ground up with a team. I always call it the fixing a boat trope sort of thing, because that's when I see it in like movies and TV shows like Forrest Gump and stuff like that. Um, happens in Mad Ship. It happens in a lot of things that I really love. And I love the act of people coming together to build something from the ground up. And that is exactly what this book is. <laughs> So I loved it. Um, I had a really great time. I don't know if it's like a five star. I don't know if I'll reread it. I'm for sure reading the prequel, although we'll see if it works as well now that we don't have this narrative framework, right? Like I do think a large reason why I really liked it is I liked watching it start from nothing and becoming something. And actually someone in my discord compared it to progression fantasy. So lit RPGs where you're just acquiring more skill points and things and that's like different items on the menu. And I'm like, yeah, it's kind of like that. So maybe 
I should try some progression fantasy once in a while. But yeah, I really enjoyed it. Something that I was annoyed about, not about the book, but about all of you on the internet, is everyone talks about the frickin' cinnamon rolls. And maybe it's because I don't like cinnamon rolls. I don't. I, I, I don't hate cinnamon rolls. If someone gives me a cinnamon roll, I'll eat it. But there is such thing as too much of a cinnamon roll, and I will get sick from having too much of a cinnamon roll. You know, like the really big ones from like Cinnabon can't, can't handle it. Um, so that was another thing. Everyone just kept talking about cinnamon rolls. But there's a cat. There's like a dire cat and no one told me about that. And I'm like, hello, hello. And so that was wonderful. And I know a lot of people say they don't like that and like nothing happens. I actually thought there was quite a good plot for this. Like it, I liked that I knew it was low stakes. So I liked knowing everything had to be okay by the end. Like, you know, when you read a romance novel and stuff, it's like I liked knowing that whatever happens in the middle, we're getting out of this somehow. But I actually thought there were some really interesting, like, character interactions that I didn't know how they would play out. Interesting problem solving. Like, things were happening. There were issues and we had to resolve issues. We had to problem solve together. I think that's compelling. I think that's momentum moving and it's actually why I would read this over maybe watching the movie version of it. I really enjoyed Legends and Latte. This one, I think, lives up to the hype. It is exactly what is printed on the box, as they say. This was great. I wanted to get that one out of the way because this this makes the whole project worth it, right? Like this was this whole project's worth it because I read Legends and Latte and I get the hype, I understand it, maybe learned a little bit more about myself as a reader. We're now gonna get into Babel, which um, we'll, we'll first talk about why I was very, 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 very nervous and putting off reading this book. For context, I have read the entire Poppy War trilogy. I have a Should You Read for that series. If you have watched that, you know how much I don't like The Burning God. I gave both Poppy War and Dragon Republic four solid stars. No question asked, they were both really compelling, great reads, I enjoyed those two. Burning God, I think, is a two star, I don't enjoy its execution. And that's where I actually think I started to notice this author has consistent things she uses in her toolbox that don't work for me as a reader. So not necessarily objectively like, this is a bad way to do your art, just more like when you choose to do your art this way, this emotional moment doesn't land for me. And without that emotional moment, this book is really boring for me. Like it's that sort of thing where there's no payoff for me because the way she chooses to set things up and execute things doesn't give me payoff, right? So it's really personal, but I was starting to notice this pattern. So that's one thing I'm really nervous about is that when I watched hours and hours of reviews for this for my recent release roundup, Everyone basically said that if you like the characterizations in the Poppy War trilogy, you will like the characters here, but it's not different. We haven't grown or changed her approach from the Poppy War trilogy to Babel, and I agree with that. Um, and that was an issue for me because that's, a, that's why I read. I love character interactions. I love characterizations. And this, for me, how she does it doesn't really work. So that was something I was nervous about and ended up, unfortunately, being kind of correct. The thing, though, that I also was nervous about that didn't end up being correct, so I liked it more than I expected, was this is quote-unquote dark academia. I, I don't know what dark academia is. It's like I don't really know what grimdark is. If you know what dark academia is for yourself, maybe this is that. This is commentary on academic life, but it's not even really about that. It's more commentary on colonialism through the lens of how maybe academia and institutions of that ilk play into those systems. Um, and at times it does capture the idea of studying until your brain's just mud on the floor. Like it does capture that. So if those are things you like in Dark Academia, that that is here. But something I didn't really like about the Poppy War and I get nervous about because I know she's in academia and everyone in academia takes different things away from it, different things that help them get through the pressures. And something that used to happen to me, when especially when I was the age RF Kuang is now, because um, I think she's like 26 or 27. When I was that age, I was all about pushing myself as hard as I could. Just like, that's what you had to do to succeed. That's how academia works. And it's very glorified, like extremely glorified in most fields of academia, that those are the winners. If you aren't putting in 60 hours a week in the lab, you are a failure. How dare you? Like, that's the type of culture that exists. And I wasn't sure what that messaging would be in this book. And I was really nervous about it because I just defended and graduated last year. And I'm still very, very jaded about my entire academic experience and academia as an institute. Like I don't need my eyes opened. <laughs> I don't like how it treats many marginalized communities. I really don't. Like 
basically anyone who is not what we would consider average or normal. Like, if you're not a white dude, the system is set up against you in some way or another. Basically, if you are marginalized, being in academia is a mess, okay? <laughs> Period. There are so many of those things. And I knew that was going to come across here. I knew for a fact that that theming wouldn't rub me the wrong way, but I was worried about the potential glorification of overwork since a little bit of that maybe almost could arguably be happening in the poppy war. That didn't happen here. At no point did I think we were pro how overworked these students were. And that was good. And that way it reminded me a little bit of Vita Nostra, although I still vastly, vastly prefer Vita Nostra to this book. So that was my expectations and where I was right and where I was wrong. Um, I will say, do I think this book is worth the hype? I mean, it's a loaded question, right? Do I think when people write reviews with um, language like this is a masterpiece, what were other ones? It's brilliant. I've read those a lot of times and obviously everything is taste. If this was a masterpiece or beautiful to you, I'm really jealous. I'm really happy for you. I guess I wonder what I would consider a masterpiece to myself. I mean, a few things that are a masterpiece to myself are the Broken Earth trilogy. That's something I guess maybe I would give that title to. I don't have many things I would give that title to. I love a lot of books. But I do think very few I would give Masterpiece Brilliant. I'd probably give Goliath, even though it's one of the hardest books I've ever read. Um, this was, I think, very accessible. It was very approachable. And I think it accomplished its mission and its idea of a project, which I do give it points for. I ended up giving this book a three and a half out of five because of its project and how it accomplished its project. Like that execution I did like, even though the execution of characterization really fell flat for me. And although its project is to be thematically loud, that is like, it's a feature. It's not a bug. I know what it's trying to do there. I know it's trying to pierce through the noise and really get to people and be like, I'm not being subtle here. Subtlety does not know the themes of this book, which is fine. That's, that's not an issue. I mean, I just mentioned the Broken Earth trilogy. That's not a subtly themed book. So I'm cool with that, okay? I even just called that book a masterpiece. Like, I call the Broken Earth Trilogy a masterpiece, and it is thematically also loud. Also about very similar things. Like, the idea of empire and colonialism, you know, using people for their resources while abusing them. There's a lot of overlap. There's even, you know, schools that are bad. Like, but why does one really work for me and I call a masterpiece and the other? And I do think it just comes down to execution. Um... For me, I love being in Jemison prose. Um, that's just the thing. I love hearing how she talks. She's really snarky and sassy to me in my head when I read her prose. I just enjoy that. I can notice what RF Kuang prose are. She is not someone who doesn't have a voice. Her work has a voice. If you give me a couple pages of her work, I'll know that it's her. At this point, because I felt that instantly while reading this, like, oh yeah, it is like reading The Poppy Warrior. I remembered what that experience was like. It does trigger that sort of thing. But for me, I don't I don't connect with it. It doesn't feel enjoyable to me. And so it, it wasn't bad, like the thematic loudness of it all. But I think it made me notice it more than when I'm with just Jemison. It's more cathartic. And I think why people really like Babel is it's either very cathartic or really eye-opening or a combination of the two. And I totally see that. Um, another thing that I didn't really like is this book uses footnotes. And that's not bad. I love books with footnotes. I, Chorus of Dragons has footnotes. Really love that. Um, they are also sassy footnotes. Those are also books within the world. There's an argument to be made that maybe Babel is set within the world it is. That maybe it is an in-text book. Maybe. There's there's an, a, an argument to be made for that. But even then, it doesn't feel like a lot of the times the footnotes were necessary. But it didn't bother me till the last third of the book. Up until that point, I'm like, okay, these footnotes are here. They're providing some some input, some information, filling in the blanks. I don't mind it. Um, at that point, I was okay with it. I don't... Sometimes it can be jarring, you know, to be reading a page and be like, okay, now I have to go down to the footnote and now back up. Like, it's it does break immersion a little bit to do that. And even with the audiobook that I did listen to for the two-thirds latter half of the book, it would put it in and it had a different voice narrator, so it was obviously when it was a footnote. But near the end of the book, we're breaking up momentum in scenes to read half-page-long footnotes. And I just think that was a bad choice. Um, I... I'm not saying that that information didn't need to be there, but I think there's a way to weave it in better. I, literally, it would break up the momentum of high action scenes. For suddenly, we used to have footnotes that were just like two or three sentences, little anecdotes that like filled in the blanks, maybe of the characters or the history of the world. And now the footnotes are as long as the prose. 
And they're breaking up scenes in these high action tension moments that are in parts four and five of this book. And I just, I, I don't get along with that execution choice. I just don't. Um, it wasn't working for me. And then there's the characterization problem for me, which is consistent. So if you like Garf Kwong's characters, you're going to like the characters in this book. Um, and they're not bad characters. I really like Robin. I think Robin's really interesting. I, I think what it really showed me is there are things that happen to our characters because of events in the book, right? Like, like any other book. The plot happens, so characters must respond. They may grow. They may change, right? And for some reason, even though this is a third-person point-of-view story where, where we get to be in Robin's head, so it's, it's not, you know, we're not so distant from him. We don't know his thought processes. For some reason, there is information re re held from us. Um, and it's not my favorite thing, especially because there there is a turning point for Robin. Robin decides things. Robin is going through things. And for some reason, I'm being shut out of that moment. And so I feel more jarred and feel like there's more of a jump than getting to go along for the ride. Because the entire time before that, I just get to go along with him. I'm more, and it felt like it was, I don't know, it's, and this happened to me in the Poppy War too, where it's just like, I could get behind this if you just let me in <laughs> as the reader of the story who was let in before. It feels like a weird trick to not suddenly let me in now. Um, and that's how I felt with a lot of what happened with Robin at the end, especially with some of his thought processes and decisions and how he was responding. I had to get all that information from conversations he was having with another character. And although that did fill in some of the gaps, it wasn't satisfying enough to me. I also felt like we were given an ensemble cast, but we weren't allowed to have an ensemble cast, if that makes sense. I think I, I knew this going in, so I wasn't disappointed. But this happened in the Poppy War, where I'm given a team of people that I'm supposed to really like and fall for, and they're supposed to be this cohort. Again, we have four people in a cohort, but you don't get to spend a lot of time with them, and you don't get to spend a lot of time with interactions, and because maybe it made more sense for story momentum, when we are shown moments, they are always, not always, there are a few happy moments that were shown, but the vast majority of the moments that are not told to us in a montage fashion, because the first third of this book, maybe first half, there's a lot of montaging. If you don't like telling, there's a lot of telling in the first half of this book. A lot of montaging, a lot of fast forwarding in time to keep things going, which isn't a thing I dislike. But when we choose to have a snapshot into it, when we choose to break the timeline and jump in, it's always for a moment of trauma or sadness. And that's a choice. It's just not a choice I usually get on with. Um, especially when I'm supposed to believe that these four people were such a tight knit group. And I could actually imagine a lot of it because of my experience in academia. It's like, oh yeah, I totally get the misery loves company, the commiserating that you just need each other to get through. Long. Like I could fill in those blanks with my own personal experience, but I also usually like the author to meet me more halfway than what she typically does with character interactions. And that's just a choice. Um, and it's just my personal you know, subjective interpretation. Obviously, a lot of people really like these characters. I have seen so many reviews where people are very invested. And I'm not going to lie, there was a moment in this book where I texted one of my friends and I went, you know, I, I'm not going to say what I said because that probably would spoil something. But I was, I was, I had emotions, which is important. I don't know if I had the emotions everyone else had, but I had emotions. And that's always something when a book can elicit emotions. Um, so this wasn't a bad experience. It's not my favorite because mainly how she chose to tell the story, not because of the story itself. And I actually don't mind its weird magic system and its focus on translation to tell this version or this angle on colonialism. I think it's actually really apt. I think what's interesting is although we have chapters of lectures on translation, which weren't bad for me. I mean, they were fine. They, they read a little like, by, like my own dissertation, which I wouldn't want anyone to ever read my own dissertation, but I didn't mind it. They were a little academic and dry, but like, it was fine. And like, I've also, it, it probably didn't help that I've already read her own essay on translation in a short story collection. And I've heard many other authors like Ken Liu talk about translation. So like a lot of the things she brought up, I've already been exposed to. So it wasn't like my first time. But also, I, what I found, found interesting as someone who's been learning a second language, and like, obviously, she knows more languages than me, and she has translated more than me. So she has a very different experience and honestly, more of an expert than me. But when I am translating, when I am learning a new language, the first thing I notice, and it was something that, that was brought to mind when I read Braiding Sweetgrass, um, is my brain has to rewire I am re-growing, arranging my neurons to think differently. I need to learn to accept information in a different order than I'm used to. 
um, because even Spanish to English, really close languages, like the order of events is different and you never realize how like, I don't know how to say, how programmed you are to expect certain information to come to you to process that, to turn it into thought that you interpret. When you're like, wait, you've given me this information up front, but I don't have the context to put that in. And that's what's really insidious about making people learn a language that is not of their people, because you're rewiring brains, rewiring cultural thought paths. And that's like a big thing that was brought up in Braiding Sweetgrass with indigenous languages and things like that. And how, you know, just... The, even the idea that every language would have verbs and subjects used in the same way is laughable. It's just not how it works because not every culture and not every people are trained to think the same way. And that doesn't come through in this book um, for me. So the parts of translation that I find fascinating are not in this book. Not that I dislike what was in this book. So like I said, three and a half out of five stars. I understand it's hype, but I don't think it's worth the hype, if that makes sense. Especially because for some reason, at least... I, I'm not surprised for, like, a general public, you know, especially with Book of the Month. It's gotten huge buzz in, like, people who maybe only usually read general fiction. Like, I totally see it being in its moment and reaching a lot of people who maybe have not read a book like this. But I actually am kind of confused about the Nebula nomination, and I'm going to actually be a little confused for the Hugo. Like, it's inevitable. I feel like it's going to happen. And it, maybe I shouldn't be because thematically it's really close to a memory called Empire and Desolation called Peace, but those have one Hugo's. And a lot of the times when I read reviews about people who have these strong positive reactions, it's because it's like, this is such a unique piece of work. This is something I've never read before. This is something that really needed to be out there. And although I would say that this is maybe the most palatable form, most approachable, most aggressively going to hold your hand and show you the point thematically book. I, I strongly disagree that we haven't had science fiction or fantasy that is trod on this ground. This is really standard colonialism and capitalism taking from people. And maybe it's because those other books weren't as aggressively loud with their theming, even though I would say the Broken Earth trilogy is really similar and all three of those books won Hugo's. So I don't know. I, I'm, I think I'm more confused when I think about it in those lenses, but I understand, especially because her prose are really readable. They're not my favorite. Like, I don't feel like I'm having a friend tell me a story like I do with some of my favorite authors, but they're incredibly readable. The pacing is a little off in the middle of this book where I'm just like, okay, this book didn't need to be almost, I said 500 pages. I think my copy's like 500 pages. It probably could have been like 400, but it's fine. You know, that's nitpicking at that point. I have other, <laughs> other complaints other than the pacing of this book. So yeah, that's the ramble. And that's why I probably couldn't make this a vlog because if I made it a vlog, like I would have had that much to say about the first half, just different words. And then I still would have had to finish up my thoughts when I finished it. Um, so yeah, I, I, at least I have legends and lattes <laughs> from this experiment. And I didn't hate reading Babel. It was just more, I don't know. It was, it was an interesting exercise in figuring out where I would fall and why things worked or didn't work for me and where I fall in like the court of public opinion. Um, especially because there are so many people who love this book who have similar tastes to me and so many people who hate this book with similar tastes to me. It's, it's truly a book that I think is more divisive than we think, maybe? I mean, I don't know. I don't actually know that many negative reviews. I know like two. <laughs> so <laughs> there's that. Um, but I wouldn't steer you away from Babel unless you, like me, have had strong issues with specifically characterization. Um, if you have had issues with that and that is like a thing you care about in books, if both of those things are true, this might not be worth it for you. The audiobook is lovely though. So like if you want to listen to an audiobook, it's a really well done one. I really liked the um, dialogue and accents that that person brought forth. It was really good. So that's this video. Please go check out the playlist and see what other books people have read. I have been in our group chat and people have been suffering. <laughs> per usual, I did not suffer that much, but I was more using this to do some homework because these were like the two hyped books of 2022 that I somehow hadn't read and was dra dragging my feet. So if you want to leave any of your thoughts on either of these books, feel free in the comments, write spoiler and space a couple times if you want to talk about any specific event, um, just so we don't spoil anyone or find me in my discord and we can chat there. And if you want to leave an emoji, leave a tower for the Tower of Babel. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.